looks to educate members of the public and, more importantly, Congress on issues like the NPT. If you find today's briefing interesting and informative, which I'm sure you will, I would encourage your member to join the caucus. Future forms and briefings that the caucus sponsors will focus on similar issues like uh, nuclear modernization and nuclear uh, the threat of nuclear terrorism. But more information on the caucus, there is a dear colleague outside on the signing table. And without further ado, I will now turn it over to Henry Sikorsky from NPEP to introduce today's speakers and kick off the discussion. Henry? Okay. I hear the rustling of potato chips. <laughs> My name is Henry Sikolsky. I run the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center, and thank you for coming. Uh, the, the key reason we're holding this event uh, has to do with one of the handouts. This little volume represents some of the preliminary findings of a two-year project funded by a lot of different organizations. You take a look at the assumptions driving the implementation and interpretation of the nuclear rules, principally the IA statute and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it essentially challenges those premises. In the back, there is an essay, which we'll hear more about, uh, from Victor Galinsky that he and I wrote, entitled, Serious Rules for Nuclear Power Without Proliferation. It is, if you will, the summation of the key findings of the research we commissioned. In the fall, there will be another volume of commissioned research. This is just half or less of the commissioned research. The Army War College will publish it. Now today, uh, we we're really lucky. We have actually three people who are very serious about non-proliferation, and, and I say that uh, thinking that there aren't many, and three is a lot. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is, although any politician or leader worth their salt will say that nuclear proliferation is the biggest problem we face, when you ask them what it is they would like to do to address this great problem, you end up with some mumbling about international or multinational fuel banks or you know, coordinated positions on principles for nuclear security or some such that really suggests it can't possibly be a very serious problem. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're in the circuit, and I am, and you were able to get a dollar for every time you went to an event that had the word strength in it, um, you can take your wife or your significant other out to many dinners. And it, that word is ubiquitous in this field. And it doesn't mean very much, is my impression, because it's so ubiquitous. A couple of current events to get people thinking about the relevance of this point set that I made. Uh, first, uh, just two days ago it was announced that Taiwan would adopt what's called the gold standard of non-proliferation rules, which means it's going to forego making nuclear fuel and adopt, we assume, the additional protocol, which is an intrusive set of inspections, uh, a bit more ins intrusive than the, the standard safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency. This was not supposed to happen. Uh, we were told that we were only going to push for this standard with the United Arab Emirates and maybe some other Middle Eastern countries. So. This raises the question, well, what about the agreements we're going to strike on nuclear cooperation, or restrike, I should say, with South Korea, uh, China, there's been some discussion of Jordan, I don't know, you know what the political situation of Jordan is, Saudi Arabia. Uh, it also raises, more generally, the question of how important it is to be recycling fuel if there's a downturn in nuclear power production internationally, particularly in countries like Japan. Uh, in addition, uh, we know from just reading the news about Iran and North Korea, there seems to be a bit of a problem on inspections and on enforcement when it comes to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the IEA. And most recently, uh, we've learned that 
the non-proliferation treaties call for good faith efforts to reduce nuclear armory has run into a bit of a snag, uh, and that is, it's not the Republicans, it's, it's not the pro-missile defense people. Uh, apparently the Russians are getting cold feet, and they've announced that we're coming down in numbers such that they don't want to proceed unless uh, certain key third parties get involved. I, I would think that would start off with China, but then China's connected to India, and India's connected to Pakistan, and somewhere along the line, Israel comes in, I suppose. So this suggests that there may be some issues about doing a bit more than tweaking the rules. And it does suggest that we're at a, at a point where we can start thinking about uh, no rules just right, which is uh, you know, caving or bombing. You know, in other words, if you have a problem, you just give up. Or, or you threaten people you know, with acts of war. Uh, Neither sounds very enticing to me. And with that, I thought what we'd do is start off with Victor. Uh, he is roughly the, the heart and soul of my organization, I think. Uh, we have been friends now for at least uh, 30 years. And uh, actually, uh, the rate of exchange uh, of ideas has increased. Uh, over time. So with that, Victor, why don't you take the lead? You can read the bios. I think uh, these folks don't really need an introduction. Uh, let's just say that every one of these people speaks from experience. Uh, thank you, Henry. Um, to get right into this, Henry and I have come up with uh, five principles uh, to guide proliferation, proliferation policy. Uh, provide a kind of framework which we think is lacking. Uh, let me say a word about, I, I'm going to go right through them, but let me say a word about our assumptions. First of all, proliferation is bad. I don't know whether how many of you watch South Park. But this is bad. Uh, but um, we also assume that in the future, whatever, whatever may have been the fact in the past, in the future, the likely source for nuclear explosives uh, for a possible bomb program is probably going to be the nuclear, civilian nuclear power program in a particular country for reasons we can discuss. We also take the point of view that where there's a trade-off between nuclear power advancing and security, we lean in favor of security, international security. Well, let me uh, go right through these, and uh, which we regard as pretty much the minimum that we need to have uh, reasonable, reasonably control the proliferation risks, particularly if we're going to expand the uh, use of nuclear power. And they reflect uh, various deficiencies in the system now. Okay, number one is locking down the NPT, making it very hard, essentially impossible, for countries to leave the NPT. Uh, certainly, it should not be possible for a country to gather up material which they can use for bombs and then leave. And certainly not if they're in violation of their responsibilities, as North Korea was. Now, when North Korea left the treaty, everyone deployed that. But I, I have to say, I don't remember anyone saying, it is not legal for you to leave a treaty. You cannot leave in violation. Uh, now, you could say, what difference does it make? Uh, how much more could we have done in terms of sanctions? I think these questions of legitimacy are really important in the world. And they're intangible, but they are important. And would have set a useful precedent. I would go beyond that, Henry, and I would go beyond that, and say that any country which has acquired materials or facilities that shorten the distance to a bomb program, to a bomb, cannot leave the treaty under those circumstances because they acquired them with the forbearance of all the other countries on the assumption that these were for peaceful uses. Um, number two, there has to be a technological safety margin between civilian activities and military ones. Everyone agrees to that. Uh, the treaty can't be a vehicle for allowing countries to come arbitrarily close 
to a weapons capability uh, without quite doing that. Uh, the problem is there's language in the NPT that countries point to, probably Iran points to recently, uh, which says countries have an inalienable right to um, pretty much all technology, all peaceful technology. Well, in the treaty, that's qualified in two ways. One way it's qualified, it says, in accordance with Articles 1 and 2. In other words, you have to interpret that in terms of the Non-Proliferation Act articles. And those are the overriding considerations. Um, there are two problems. One is plutonium, one is uranium, highly rich uranium. In the case of plutonium, you know, there is no economic case for uh, reprocessing and separating plutonium. And therefore, it seems to us that one can simply rule that out. That nobody should have separated plutonium, period. <clears throat> the enriched uranium one is obviously more difficult, and that's the one at issue in Iran. And it is not clear exactly where you draw the line. That's a quandary at the present time. But we have to find a reasonable way of dealing with that. The other, and, and the reason that isn't so simple is because in that qualification to the inalienable right language, on the one hand, it says it has to be in accordance with the non-proliferation articles, but it also says on a non-discriminatory basis, which means you have to apply reasonably consistent rules. And for example, in the case of enrichment, we have Brazil, which has a comparable enrichment program, uh, just to take one case. Uh, it also has not signed the so-called uh, uh, um, additional protocol, right? Thank you. <laughs> and so it, it, it's just an indication that this is not a simple matter, but it's one we have to address and we have to end up with a reasonable safety margin. Uh, number three is the question of intrusive inspections. Because both enrichment, uh, reprocessing and enrichment lend themselves, centrifuge enrichment, lend themselves to small scale applications very small scale. You have to worry about clandestine facilities, and therefore you, the, the inspectors have got to have the rights to examine, to inspect beyond the specific sites cited in their agreements with the, the country's agreements with the IAEA. Um, there was the additional protocol that expands those rights to a certain extent, but there's a downside in that, and that the trade-off, first of all, it's voluntary, not all countries have accepted it. And, uh, and uh, the trade-off is that the regular inspections have been reduced. Uh, the IAEA does have the right to, to perform what are called special inspections, but has been very shy about using that. So in one way or another, everyone who gets into nuclear energy has to understand that because of the intrinsic dangers, uh, you just have to accept certain limitations on sovereignty, and inspectors, when circumstances warranted I have to have uh, very considerable rights. Number four of the five is predictable NRC enforcement, uh, NPT enforcement. Um, there is no provision for enforcement in the treaty. It is handled on an ad hoc basis. It is pretty much uh, every new circumstances is uh, sort of sui generis. It, it, there needs to be a regular agreed upon response at least to the to the possibility that a country announces withdrawal. Uh, otherwise these things are up for grabs and up to the uh, various calculations, political calculations at the moment. Uh, we're sort of tough with Iran. In the case of Korea, we ended up bribing them with reactors and promising to uh, postpone inspections and so on. So, uh, because they get caught up in the uh, in the politics of the day, including domestic politics of the day. So I think it's important to have agreed upon system of enforcement. I think it would help if there was a secretariat attached to the treaty. The fifth item is weapons reductions for all. Now, so far we've only had weapons reductions involve the United States and Russia. Uh, obviously this has got to extend to the other three nuclear weapons states. Uh, China, France, and Britain, <coughs> but it also has to extend to the 
remaining non-NPT weapons, countries with weapons anyway. They're not weapon states in the, in the sense of the treaty because you can't become a weapon state anymore in the sense of the treaty if you have an exploder bomb by 1967. But India, Israel, Pakistan, North Korea have got to be part of this process. Uh, it, it, you can't have a process where everyone is reducing their weapons, but the ones that are outside the treaty keep their weapons. That's ridiculous. Um, I, I think, we think that uh, we ought to simply take the view that with the treaty being accepted by 190 countries, that it is universal and applicable to the ones who haven't signed it as well. I would treat them that way. Uh, there have to be certain penalties to that. Now, you could take the positive view and say, so long as they participate in the, in the weapons reductions that everyone else is participating in, they could be treated as on their way to compliance. Now, we know this is a tough sell. Uh, Henry and I weren't born yesterday. Uh, we're no, under no illusions that uh, people are going to run and accept this, or that the United States can twist arms to make it happen. It has to be as a result of basically general consensus, uh, worldwide consensus. But the U.S. role is critical in starting an adult conversation on this subject. Uh, that this is what it takes to have reasonable protection in a world of expanding nuclear power, even in, in the current, under the current uh, arrangements. Uh, here's the punchline. Uh, in the meantime, uh, lacking adequate protection, does it make sense, I would say it does not make sense, for us to be pushing for expanding nuclear power worldwide if we don't have this level of protection? Thank you. Right. I'm reminded of your story. You, you didn't use the Yitzhak but in the story. We'll, we'll say, we expect that story out of you before you leave today. It has something to do with the requirements for winning. If you don't meet them, you lose. We'll talk about that later. Now, there is another co-conspirator in the making here. Which is Jamie Fly, uh, a newer friend for sure, uh, but one who is co-hosting this event. All of the sign-up sheets, all of the, the work and staffing associated with taking the invitations, this is fault. And uh, the handouts, uh, they're your fault too. <laughs> Actually, uh, the staffs of MPEC and SPI are in the background here, literally, uh, but they deserve some applause and some help, so they certainly have my support. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jamie, why don't you come up and uh, we'll go through the commentaries and we'll open things up. Please. Again, take a look at the bios. This is not someone who just has a political position but someone who has experience working proliferation issues in the executive branch at a pretty high level. Thanks, Henry. Uh, I will also say, I think, for those of you in the back, if you want to sit down, there are a few seats uh, up here at the front. Um, we're always pleased at FBI to co-host uh, events with Henry and MPEC, and uh, I've been a big fan of Henry's and uh, his work at MPEC for, for years, including when I was in the the Bush administration, and I'm always honored when he invites me to speak at events like this. I uh, am also uh, honored to be up here with people uh, whose, whose work I've followed for quite some time. I will say I have nothing like the level of experience uh, of the other panelists. Um, I consider myself uh, a generalist on foreign policy issues. I just happened to end up working on non-proliferation for four years uh, in the second term of the Bush administration. But it's something I became passionate about and uh, am indeed very concerned about uh, the current direction uh, of our uh, world on this issue and of U.S. policy. So I'm just going to highlight a few things. I largely agree with everything laid out in the, the paper that Victor and, and Henry have already discussed, and I'll just highlight a few other uh, recommendations that, I, that I'd make to address uh, this issue. Um, I think clearly, uh, just you look at the world situation, um, we're beginning to see, I think, uh, a real uh, key moment develop where we have uh, states that have left the NPT, uh, like North Korea, which was mentioned, 
uh, which is now proliferating nuclear technology, has in the past to Syria. Hopefully it has gone to other countries, but there have been concerns. You had the AQCon network, obviously, uh, which uh, shared sensitive nuclear technology uh, and, and know-how uh, to a variety of countries. Uh, and right in front of us on a daily basis, you have Iran's uh, substantial progress towards a nuclear weapons capability. And when I look back at this, I really, I mean, I don't think this, that this is a, a partisan or should not be a partisan issue whatsoever because we've had administrations of both political parties that have failed in their efforts to stem this proliferation. Um, so I think that uh, especially because of our own willingness to uh, refute the notion that all states have uh, the right to the entire fuel cycle uh, and to sensitive nuclear technology and processes, uh, will just speed up this uh, cascade of proliferation that we see developing. And I think the, the key aspect of that will especially be the case if Iran develops uh, nuclear weapons. And that, of course, uh, I think it's hard to argue that if you did have a, a cascade of proliferation uh, in the Middle East after Iran goes nuclear, uh, I think very few people would even be able to maintain that the nuclear non-proliferation regime would even still survive that, uh, which would uh, really open up kind of uncharted territory. Um, so that's why I think it's important for us to have these sorts of events and have these uh, uh, discussions and get into the issues we're talking about today. Um, I just wanted to start off before I have a few uh, specific recommendations. I'm obviously uh, a Republican and conservative, and I know that uh, a lot of times those of us on the right are very skeptical of treaties in general. You just look at the debate about New START, you look at the debate in the Senate more recently about Law of the Sea. We, uh, I think, and rightfully so, are often cautious about uh, giving too much power to international agencies or bodies because we think that they often become bureaucratic, corrupt, uh, anti-American, overly politicized. Um, at least in the case of uh, the NPT, I would certainly argue that this is a regime and a treaty that have benefited us greatly. Uh, and actually, I think we would, we would be better served by, as Victor and Henry talk about in their paper, uh, by strengthening it, not running away from it. Um, I would also say the same thing about the International Atomic Energy Agency. And again, just as coming at this from someone who uh, was a, in a policy-making role in the U.S. government, I think people don't uh, quite understand uh, how important the IEA has been, despite the, the setbacks it has faced and we've faced in our efforts to slow Iran's nuclear program or get to the bottom of Syria's program. But it's, I think, worth imagining what uh, things would have been like without uh, an IEA, without an agency that had inspectors on the ground on a regular basis in Iran, in its nuclear uh, enrichment facilities, providing information back. If you think about it, separate from the intelligence reports that leak out from time to time, that's really our only clear insight into what Iran has achieved and uh, where it might be headed uh, with those uh, reports that come out of the IEA every several months. And my experience working, uh, especially when I was at the White House and interacting with uh, officials of the IAEA, in general you have a tireless uh, core group of technical experts who uh, do not see this as an issue of promoting a particular country's agenda, but really want to ensure that the regime is upheld and want to get to the bottom of any violations that uh, do occur. I was uh, involved in our effort to share information with the IAEA after uh, Israel bombed the Al-Khabar a uh, nuclear reactor in Syria in late 2007 and in early 2008 in the spring when we rolled out publicly information about uh, what that program had uh, been uh, about and then shared a, a lot of information with the IEA. Uh, I can tell you the IEA immediately set to work and uh, tried to dig up its own information, uh, paid several uh, visits to the Syrians uh, to try, including to the site in question, took uh, samples, uh, a lot of this was reported in the press. And, and started to try to get to the bottom of uh, the problem, uh, just as it has over the years uh, in Iran, just as it has, and you can read a lot uh, of this in some variety of books that have been put out about uh, their effort to get to the bottom of the AQCon network. Um, despite the fact that sometimes the IEA leadership uh, is, is politicized, and you have people like Mohammed al baradai who have their own agenda, again, I would argue that uh, you have this technical secretariat that is serious about non-proliferation and about um, trying to, to weed out those who are violating uh, the regime. I would argue, though, that we in the United States and our allies, though, have let them down uh, far too many times. Um, and I think you can just even see that in the case of both Iran and Syria, because uh, 
uh, Victor mentioned, for instance, the special inspection uh, opportunity. Um, the IEA is basically controlled to the Board of Governors uh, in part, and which means five times a year. Uh, it's a 35-member body. Uh, the United States obviously has a key role on it. But my experience was, again, this spans multiple administrations of both political parties, is that just like now, in the case of Syria, we're not willing to, as a Security Council, push certain uh, lines of action uh, very hard for fear of uh, uh, opposition from the Russians and Chinese. The same thing would play out in the Board of Governors meetings on a regular basis. And the Board of Governors, there's no veto. So uh, there are cases where we could have earlier on raised concerns about what uh, Iran was doing in terms of its stonewalling of the IAEA investigation into uh, its weaponization work, for instance, where we were not willing to push tough resolutions because we were afraid that uh, the Russians and Chinese would just vote against it, even though we would have won the vote. In the case of Syria now, uh, it's kind of become uh, an issue overtaken by events, I guess, with the regime hopefully uh, collapsing in the near future. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I strongly believe that the Obama administration should have pushed for a special inspection uh, much uh, sooner, and my guess is uh, they probably could have uh, won the vote uh, as well, even though Russia and China would have opposed that. Um, but if we are serious about the regime, we should be willing to use the tools that we have uh, to uh, uphold the regime. And I think, um, in especially the Syria case, special inspection would have forced the Syrians to either uh, refuse to accept the inspectors, which would have been even more clear about their intentions, um, or they would have had to show some of these sensitive uh, other sites that the IEA had raised with them on a, uh, a number of uh, times and had not been able to get access to. And so I think we should use the tools that we have to have them. And the fact that we're not willing to do that and have not been willing to do that on multiple occasions, I guess, uh, for me, uh, goes back to a, a real question of how serious our country is about nonproliferation, uh, not just a concern about uh, how strong the regime itself is. And so I just wanted to lay out uh, two or three quick recommendations about how I think we get more serious about nonproliferation. Um, part of this, and uh, Victor and, and Henry discussed this in their paper, uh, this whole notion of, of the pillars of the regime often highlighted our, our issues like disarmament and uh, nuclear security. And we've certainly heard a lot about this from the Obama administration. Uh, I, am, I think that those need to be part of the equation, but I think, at least in recent years, We've uh, veered too far in that direction, and we have not actually focused on uh, key cases of nonproliferation uh, and holding uh, proliferators accountable. Uh, I think that's also been evident, that was evident at the end of the Bush administration uh, when we did have this case with North Korea proliferating uh, essentially an entire uh, nuclear program to Syria. And we, in the Bush administration, I think at the end, failed to, to use that as a teachable moment, um, both because of our concerns about our uh, North Korea engagement strategy at the time, which has ended up failing as many of us feared it would. Uh, there was also a concern even beginning at the end of the Bush administration that we might want to reach out to the Syrians, and that certainly was prevalent at the beginning of the Obama administration. And in both these cases, uh, I think we uh, fell into a trap that has consistently undermined our efforts on nonproliferation. And generally, when we put broader <coughs> regional or political concerns above our seriousness about nonproliferation, um, no Syrian entities were designated, I think, until very recently uh, that were involved in that case. And those, I think, were mainly designated for, uh, as part of the broader campaign against Syria now. And the North Korean entities involved were only designated uh, by the Obama administration years after the actual transfer. And so those are just two tools that any uh, administration has that they're not often willing to use. I would also argue that we need to strengthen our interdiction uh, efforts. Uh, we don't, partly because of this focus on disarmament and nuclear security, we don't hear much about uh, initiatives like the Proliferation Security Initiative anymore. Uh, and I think there are ways to probably expand uh, and strengthen that. And Although I think the cooperation in general between the United States and the IEA is, is very strong, I think that there are cases where, especially when the U.S. has been involved in stopping uh, specific shipments, where perhaps we're a little bit too reluctant to actually share information because we're worried, either for political reasons, again, where the trail will, will lead the IEA, or because of classification issues and intelligence, which obviously need to be, uh, those risks need to be weighed, but I think one thing that at least I know we did in the Bush administration, I'm sure the Obama administration has tried to do this as well, is we need to be pressuring our intelligence community to be more open and share as much as possible with the IEA. 
to allow it to uh, pursue its investigations. Uh, a second recommendation uh, I would just pick up on where Victor ended is I think we uh, need to restore the balance between proliferation concerns and uh, the interests of the U.S. nuclear in industry, and though many of you probably attended the previous event that uh, Henry and I hosted on this issue, so I won't get into it in detail, but uh, this relates to uh, the, the 120 so-called 123 nuclear cooperation agreements, and uh, I think there are ways that Congress could act to ensure that all future agreements uh, were consistent with the so-called gold standard, or at least requiring those that were not uh, to get an up or down an up or down vote and congressional approval. Um, and the final recommendation I guess I'd make is uh, I really to return to what I highlighted at the beginning. I really do see Iran as uh, the key issue right now. Um, I think we're facing an important moment. Uh, it's really Iran is becoming uh, a case for what was highlighted in the paper. Uh, they're reaching a point where I think I basically believe they're at a nuclear threshold. Uh, if they get to the point where they will have developed nuclear weapons, my sense is they'll basically either get the whole way there or, or withdraw just before they turn the final screw. And if that's the case, again, I think it's going to be hard to argue that there will be a nuclear non-proliferation regime remaining after that happens. We'll probably see others in the region follow, uh, including several U.S. allies, um, unless we can find a way to persuade uh, dissuade them from seeking nuclear weapons. Um, so the only way to avoid this nightmare scenario is uh, to prevent Iran uh, from reaching that point in their uh, nuclear program. We've tried sanctions now for years. We've tried negotiations essentially for the last decade, either the European, <coughs> the United States, or a combination thereof, and we've been unsuccessful. Uh, and so I'm a, a strong advocate of exploring all options, uh, and including making the uh, use of military force credible uh, now that the talks appear to be breaking down, uh, because I really do think it's going to come down to a question of uh, whether we're willing to accept uh, a nuclear Iran and a polynuclear Middle East. And if you look at the statements that President Obama has made, I think that's actually driving his policy uh, more so than some of the regional concerns. He does not want to see a polynuclear Middle East and us uh, walking away. He wants to be on the path to zero, not walking away from that. Uh, goal of getting to zero. Um, so I would just end by saying I think the challenges we face in this uh, area are uh, truly unprecedented, but uh, I think if we can have a bipartisan approach of getting serious about nonproliferation, uh, if we really do want to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons, elevating that concern within how the U.S. government, those concerns within how the U.S. government makes policy, uh, I think that we have a, a chance of utilizing uh, the nonproliferation regime and institutions like the IAEA to their full extent, uh, and that will hopefully lead to a, a safer world. Thanks. Uh, by the way, there, there is going to be a pop quiz. Uh, the material you need to read is on page six. And, uh, Five. Uh, but not now. Henry. But not now. Later. Uh, there is this peculiarity about the three pillars, which got very popularized in the last review conference of the NPT, and it argues that disarmament, sharing nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, and nonproliferation are absolutely equally important and have to be balanced and traded off. Uh, there's a critique of that. You can imagine, uh, there's something a little unscrewed about that. Uh, it is a non-proliferation treaty. First and foremost, those other pillars are concomitant benefits of getting non-proliferation. I don't think they're equal in importance to be balanced and traded off for obvious reasons, which we can get into later. Now, the last speaker is not my oldest friend or my newest friend, but he is a friend. And George has I think humored me over the years longer than most. <laughs> uh, he is always gracious and allows me to come over to his place. We, we cooperate on an awful lot of things. And I consider him one of my better friends. So on that note, George, you get the last word. Thanks, Henry. Um, and thank you and Jamie for organizing this and for uh, to you folks for all turning out. And it's, it's a pleasure to be on a, on a podium with Victor as well. 
Um, I'm, I'm just going to pick up on a little bit of what Victor laid out and what's in the paper and then a little bit on what Jamie said. Um, in a sense, I think agreeing with, with almost all of it, but trying to then you know, advance the discussion or the debate and, and, and further specify the, the challenge. Um, the first thing I would say is that the way Henry began by framing the approach, and it's in the title of their, their paper, is emphasizing rules. And I, and, and I think rules do bear emphasizing and do have great value. And one of the reasons for that is that when you compare rules to the alternative, um, it, it quickly becomes evident that as frustrating as rules can be, the alternatives uh, are even more frustrating or dangerous. So one of them being anarchy, an environment in which there are no constraints, no rules, perhaps no norms. In an area when you're talking about weaponry, uh, like nuclear weaponry, that kind of anarchic environment um, would be profoundly destabilizing, dangerous, and, and would immediately lead you to try to create rules even if they didn't exist. Another alternative to rules, uh, which is related, is, is war. You say, all right, we're not going to try to regulate this stuff by rules, but if somebody gets out of line, we'll just whack them. And we'll just keep whacking them uh, as long as people get out of line. Um, again, we've experienced uh, that. Sometimes you have to do it, but it's obviously suboptimal uh, and, and comes with lots of consequences that uh, should be self-evident. A related option is, and, and this was tried um, with a coherent theory, but it was, and it was tried in 2003, and we can talk about the, the, the consequences of that, which is um, regime change. Now, that can come with war, can come without war, but you basically don't try to establish rules to regulate the management and possession of technology. You just focus on um, the character of the people who possess it. And you say, okay, certain people aren't going to be allowed to have this, and so if those people try to get it or get it, we just get rid of them or their governments. Um, but we don't focus on rules uh, per se regarding technology. And again, that that is, is problematic um, in, in, in its execution. So you get back to rules, which is again where, where the gist of this paper and this conversation is. You know, we have rules, but they need to be strengthened, they need to be uh, modified. And one of the core challenges here, and, 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 and Victor I think alluded to it, but I, I, I think it has to be emphasized uh, more clearly because you can't solve the problem without recognizing the profundity of the challenges, that a rule-based uh, system, if it's based on a double standard, and then on top of the double standard is implemented by selective enforcement, becomes very, very difficult to sustain. Because Lots of people don't agree with the double standard. If you're on the, the gain side of the double standard, uh, it's great. But if you're on the perceived to be on the loss side of the double standard, not so good. You have no motivation to support the enforcement. And if on top of that, the enforcement itself is selective, arbitrary, whimsical, you get lots of defections. Why should we be part of this? And it actually offends people's sense of justice, and there's more and more psychological literature, uh, you know, that, that talks about the actual physical effects of injustice and how it motivates people uh, to act. So this is more than just a moral, political issue. There, 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 there are material dynamics here, and and one of the challenges we have in the non-proliferation uh, uh, regime, the rule-based system, is that for very understandable reasons, uh, at its inception. Um, there, it is built on a double standard, or at least a temporary double standard. And then going forward since its inception, there's been a fair amount of selective enforcement. And Jamie mentioned some examples of selective enforcement. We can come up with other uh, examples. Friends of the United States do experiments that turn out to have been in violation of their safeguards agreements. We find out later, the IA goes and investigates, but we block having it sent to the Security Council for a report. But then somebody else does something like that, and we're insisting that it go to the Security Council. And so there are different examples that came after 
the, the, the foundation itself, which was based uh, on, a, on a double standard. So, so in trying to figure out then how to strengthen the rules, and I'll talk about the, the five particulars, but in, in figuring out that general project of trying to strengthen the rules, which is worth doing, uh, we, we have to be very cognizant of the fundamental background problem of the double standard and, and selectivity of enforcement. And if you don't tackle that, you're not going to get the support you need to revise uh, the rules. Now, in the particulars, uh, Victor talked about number one, lock down the NPT, make it not possible to withdraw from the NPT. And then he has a very important amendment to that, which I think is absolutely vital, which is at least if you're not in compliance with the treaty. In other words, at least if you violated the terms of the treaty, you shouldn't be able to then withdraw from it and escape the consequences. That part, I think you could get the international agreement on if you really worked at it. The prior formulation of you just can't withdraw from the treaty without saying that if you violate its terms. I think the United States, or you wouldn't get the US Congress to support that. Because, and Jamie mentioned this, uh, you know, the Senate is very reluctant to ratify treaties in general and historically. Um, but it's almost, it, it's that much harder if there's not a withdrawal provision. The US likes the option to be able to withdraw from treaties and insist upon it, and indeed did withdraw from the ABM treaty as an example. So now you're going, imagining going to the rest of the world and say, okay, we want everybody to sign up to the idea that no one withdraws from the NPT. Well, about 170 countries are going to say, okay, great, does that mean that the U.S. will no longer insist on withdrawal provisions from treaties, nor would the U.S. exercise the right of withdrawal from treaties that it's already a party to? And the resounding answer, probably you get a 99 to 0 vote in the Senate if somebody's absent in the hospital, uh, <laughs> would be no chance. And so others know that, and so it becomes very difficult on that one. Though it would be a good thing to do. The second innovation that we talk about is, well, there should be a, a, a safety margin, technological safety margin between civil and, and, and military. Um, and Victor made the good case. You can't. There's no economic case for plutonium separation. Well, that's true. And then Henry argues, and I think plausibly in many places, there's no economic case for nuclear power, period. Um, but, but insisting on economic rationality as a standard will, will never get you anywhere, because there is so much of our economy that's fundamentally irrational. There's so much of any economy that's fundamentally irrational that you would never get agreement on defining in terms of that, I, I had a conversation with uh, Hassan Rouhani, who's the National Security Advisor in Iran from 2002 to 2005. He was the chief negotiator and was pushing on this just issue. Why, why are you guys doing enrichment? Why do you want to build this big plant in the Tons? You've only got one power plant being built. It's not done. The Russians have to supply the fuel by contract. I mean, in other words, even if you had and could make the fuel, you couldn't put it in the reactor. You'd lose the guarantee. Um, it's totally irrational. And he like looked at me and he laughed. He said, nothing in our economy is rational. Why should this be different? Um, and there's no comeback uh, to that. So I think that one is, is, is very difficult. Again, if there's a double standard. Now, if you go to a position where, where there would be no reprocessing in other countries, and as Victor alluded, you know, if we weren't enriching uranium, which isn't going to happen because our Navy insists on enriching uranium for our uh, nuclear power submarines, you know, then you might be able to get uh, to get a, to get away with that. We don't have <coughs> uranium for maybe now. Well, they already have HEU, but yeah. the idea that no one else could have the nuclear power submarines but based on HEU. But we don't. If you're going to say that we won't rely on HEU fuel on nuclear power submarines, you could make make the they may come too. Okay. The um. The third one, intrusiveness of inspections, uh, again, I, 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 they have to be much more intrusive than they've been. Again, U.S. Congress is never going to support uh, that in the U.S. And we had the most intrusive inspections ever with UNSCOM in Iraq, and we had a government that said, we don't believe the inspectors. Um, they're wrong. And so we invaded. It turned out the inspectors were right. Um, but so intrusive inspections, uh, that, that's going to be a, a, a tough Tough stuff. But again, it would be a useful thing to do. Fourth item was, well, we need to have a regular agreed-upon response and enforcement 
to the treaty. And, and then the first response to that from most of the world will be, okay, great, does that include the disarmament provision? Mm -hmm. So will there be an automatic enforcement of the nuclear disarmament provision? <laughs> um, and again, the U.S. would totally oppose uh, that. So then you'd be in a position to say, no, we should enforce only Articles 2 and 3, but not the other articles, in which case um, you've lost that argument uh, politically. The last point I, I would make is on the weapons reduction for all. Again, um, very, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a laudable objective. I, I, I share it. Um, how you get into that, uh, you know, is something that's super contentious here, obviously, um, to begin with, about what conditions you would have to meet to bring China into a reduction process, whether we would support anybody focusing on Israel as, a, as an issue where there ought to be reductions and that they should be part of a disarmament um, process. So the last thing I would say is, is it picks up on, on one of Jamie's points. He spoke about the trap of putting our broader regional concerns above non-proliferation. And that has been the history, as he alluded to, um, uh, of, of policy. You can go back to Pakistan, Israel. Uh, we have it with the India nuclear deal uh, of 2005 and 2008. Um, <clears throat> Where, where clearly a regional policy and a bilateral policy of favoring India led to uh, a, an initiative that much of the world saw as a real blow against uh, non-proliferation. And this may happen, uh, it may have happened in Syria, it may happen in other, other ways. And I, and I think um, that's why communities like this and why members of Congress who want to keep putting non-proliferation out front are so important. We may lose because there may be higher order uh, objectives, but if nobody's putting the proliferation imperative or non-proliferation imperative into it, um, there's there's zero chance actually of at least striking some kind of, of balance because this issue is one that's uh, difficult, and complicated, and, and easy to um, cast aside. So I think the kind of the warnings and the cautionary spirit of what uh, Henry and Victor have written, I think, is is, is absolutely uh, necessary. Well, I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair. Uh, let me just say that the, the rejoinders were perfect. We needed creative tension. We have supplied the creative tension. But I must say, it sounds as though you just left Foggy Bottom. Because every one of the comments that you made, with the exception maybe one, were the comments that we got from the State Department. Joe must be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that would be sort of where we're headed, yes. Uh, but, but actually, the way in which I suspect it's wrong is so much more interesting than just saying it's wrong. I can't resist. First of all, when Mr. Obama and Mr. Colton agreed on the idea that there should not be withdrawal if you're in violation, it's time to pay attention. I think to argue that is to pretty much argue that you should increase the difficulty of leaving. And when you think about it, the only way in which you would leave with any sensible reason would be if you want to get a bomb. And therefore, you're right on the cusp of violating in any logical reason you would withdraw. So I'm not sure you want to make too much of that. Also, you, you find yourself in the company of legal theorists or practitioners who are way out there. Way out. I, I won't name names. Privately, I'll give you the names. But, I mean, you know, the idea that because we want to reserve the right to withdraw, we shouldn't sign up to certain things, I, I think it doesn't make a whole lot of sense whether you're right, left, or center uh, if you're dealing with international law. I think that's overworked. And to hear it, as I did from the Obama team, I had to kind of inhale carefully uh, without letting out a whole lot of steam. Because I heard the same thing in some of the most radical legal theorists in the Bush administration, and I don't think it's sound. Uh, by the way, I say this as someone who studied law for four years in graduate school, so I come to it with a certain prejudice. The, the second thing uh, that you raised is economic rationality. Uh, that we should raise that as a standard, I think, goes without saying 
If you take a look at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and I encourage everyone to actually spend a full 10 minutes reading it so if you're a young foreign policy professionals, you can actually say you read it, which will make you better than the old ones <coughs> who haven't read it. This takes 10 minutes and that's too much time. You'll notice that it says everyone has the right to the possible benefits of peaceful nuclear explosives. You'll notice also, if you think about it, no one's exercised that right. Why? Well, it has something to do with the economics. Didn't add up. By the way, that's dead letter. It's one of the things we're being interpreted. Comprehensive test bans are bigger issues, so we don't want people doing peaceful nuclear explosives. Suggest something about the importance of at least raising up and talking about and not running away from debates over rationality and economics. With regard to intrusiveness, I would refer you to Ali Honenen, who has made it very clear in essays he's done for himself, for Harvard, for us, and probably for you. Maybe. The inspectorate staff can make these inspections a lot more intrusive without going to the uh, governing board. It needs some backbone. With regard to uh, enforcement standards, I refer you to Carnegie and the Goldschmidt Papers, which I think you rightly endorsed, supported, and he talks about the very thing which we paid him to do, which was to say the exact same thing he said for you, which is default enforcement is overdue in certain categories. Let's get on with it. I think he's right. Uh, I guess I'm going to stop because it'll be like beating up on your friend. I don't want to do that. But I think everyone should understand it, it makes a difference what you're shooting for. Now, this is a setup for the story. So I'm going to ask you to give the story, and then we're going to open it up for questions. But you've got to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not going to disappoint you. <laughs> I want to pick up on one point that, uh, before I uh, relate this own story. Um, it, it isn't a matter of banning uneconomic activities. Instead, when something's really uneconomic and they really get the point, they're a lot more amenable to changes in rules. And, and, you know, I went back and read some old all the accounts about the NPT and so on, there was a time when people were saying, my God, we cannot ban peaceful nuclear explosives. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how can you even talk about that? Well, but effectively we did. And so I think there's an educational process now. Uh, our former president uh, said reprocessing was essential. It's kind of in the wrong direction. Let me tell you the story since Henry's... Uh, years and years ago, I worked at the Rand Corporation. And one day we had Ishak Rabin, I don't know what it is. People, everybody knows who that is, but he was a victorious general, and later ambassador from Israel, you know, from the 67 war. And he came and gave a lecture on strategy, and uh, sort of general lecture. At the end of the lecture, Arms went over and said, this was years and years ago, uh, General Rabin, how, how do we win the Vietnam War? He said, that's easy, you have to take Hanoi. Immediately, people said, wait, we can't do that. The Russians would come in, the Chinese would come in. We'd have casualties, we're not ready for this. The American public wouldn't like it, wouldn't like it, and so on. He just kind of waited for all these responses. And then he said, okay, so you will lose. <laughs> yeah, that's the story. <laughs> Try to take you in turn. Raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, we appreciate it if it was a question. Uh, you probably won't appreciate it quite as much if it isn't. Any takers? I have sir. a question. Stand up and identify yourself, sir. <laughs> my name is Peter Bauer. I am with the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. And my question is related to thorium reactors. Do you have any concerns with the establishment of thorium reactors in India, China, UAE, or the proposed construction of such reactors 
Are there any safety concerns? That you <laughs> anyway, yeah. I didn't catch the word. What kind of reaction? Thorium. 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 Oh, thorium reactors. Yes. Well, the Indians have this idea that they're going to get into thorium. Okay. And uh, there's been comparatively slow engineering work on that. That it doesn't look to me to be a, a real practical uh, route because basically they're the only ones working on it. And so. Uh, doesn't seem to be a mainline concern. That would be no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next. <laughs> Awfully quiet out there. There we go. Stand up. My name's Amy Murphy. I'm a graduate student at AM at the Bush School. And I was actually wondering what do you say to people who say that the proliferation of nuclear weapons in Iran would actually stabilize the region rather than destabilize the region? I mean, it's based on the Ken Waltz article. Well, you know, we're all engaged in faith-based policy making. Uh, you're in the wrong church. That's my first comment. Uh, some of the essays in here go directly to whether the theological groundings of that optimistic outlook has a snowball's chance. You'll be stunned to hear they're not real optimistic about it. Um, generally, what isn't paid much attention to, let me try a new argument out, because you, you can't prove, uh, what do they call it, a counterfactual. Yeah, but, but do know that if you go back to 1980 and you move forward in the Middle East, you can count the number of times Israel, Iran, Iraq uh, have struck at reactors in Syria, Israel, Iraq, and Iran before, in most instances, they have even produced any material. Even if they are NPT member states or IEA charter states, even if the facility is safeguarded, even if the facility is considered proliferation resistant, this suggests the spread of just the means to get to the finishing point for nuclear weapons might itself be provocative in the way of producing acts of war that otherwise you would not want to encourage. So while that's not a proof with regard to whether everyone had nuclear weapons, it would be a happy world uh, or not, it's suggestive. Um, how lucky do you feel? By the way, you might also take a look at what happens when these things get deployed. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis is still a very interesting piece of history. And it is not a game or some kind of ideological you know, blade to be ground. I mean, it, people were getting ready to go to war. And we, we lucked out. I mean, I mean, I think it's not uh, necessarily wisdom but a heck of a lot of luck. I, I, I agree with Henry's answer, and, and I think it's a good question. Um, I, would, I would add to his answer, the, the, the point he made about the strikes against countries in the process of acquiring nuclear weapons. So Kim Walsh is talking about after they've got nuclear weapons, and there's lots of suppositions that he would make straight up, saying, you know, command and control, lots of stuff that's hard to do, but if you assume, it's like, you know, it's like in economics, they say, well, assume a perfect market. But Henry's point often gets left out that in the process of somebody's seeking that capability, you actually may give incentives for military action. I would argue, in fact, that the 65 war that Pakistan began with India was in part because Pakistan had reason to believe in the late part of 64 that India was seeking nuclear weapons and would have them in a couple of years. So, so that part is, is relevant. But I, and, and then Henry's also right about crises. It also would be important that, that for Waltz's theory you could say, well, it may be stabilizing you know, in dyads that are relatively well known, but if you start increasing the, the numbers and you get them proliferated in states where there are multiple lines of conflict, it, 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 it becomes much more 
difficult. Um, that said, I mean, you could make the argument that over time, if somehow you got through all of these problems, so you avoided the war weather acquiring capability, you avoided the learning process of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so people learned to live with it. Over time, they could be stabilizing. As Henry said, you can't disprove that, but you can't prove it otherwise. And I think Walt tends to focus on that kind of state after, of maturity. They're past adolescence, you're past your 20s, it's going to settle down too early for divorce and all of that. And so there, you know, it's that stable period that he talked about, oh, that's, that's stable. I think you have to look on the front of that and the back of that to, to be more concerned. The one thing, or two, two or three things I just meant, uh, add to that, um, just picking up on what George was saying, I, I, uh, I must admit I haven't read the, the Waltz piece, I've, I've heard a little bit about it, but the whole notion that a polynuclear Middle East can somehow be stable, I think, is, again, if it was just dyads, but given the natures of the relationships in the Middle East, uh, I find it hard to believe that if we did indeed end up with a polynuclear Middle East that it would somehow be stable. I know there are uh, scholars, experts who are starting to argue, well, the United States could dissuade certain countries from getting nuclear weapons. I tend to be skeptical of that in most cases. Um, I, I think to convince the Saudis or the Egyptians or the Turks, I mean, the Turks perhaps because of our, our NATO relationship with them, but some of these other countries, I don't think the United States, the U.S. public, the U.S. Congress is going to be in a position to uh, approve uh, new security agreements that would basically <laughs> extend our nuclear umbrella uh, to some of these uh, countries, just given the, the cultural and values differences we have with many of them. Um, the other thing we just need to remember is, again, because of the Middle East, because of the nature of the regimes involved, uh, I think that there would be some inherent instability. You just look at what's happening in Syria, I mean, uh, on a daily basis right now. Uh, we have uh, chemical weapons, you know, floating around the country, hopefully still under control of the Syrian uh, government. Um, I, I think, the, I, I certainly strongly believe that, uh, just look what's happening with the Arab revolutions. I mean, I think this regime in Iran uh, is, is, uh, is not going to last for that long, and so there's going to be some instability in Iran, uh, regardless of whether the regime falls quickly or whether it's drawn out, uh, and so yeah, that's the last type of situation you want to have, a nuclear weapons capability. And I would argue, even if the reg this regime stays in power, uh, there's a history, we dealt with this at the end of the Bush administration, of rogue commanders within the IRGC, uh, Navy, sponsoring uh, uh, attacks and operations that command, uh, commanders knew nothing about on a small basis, uh, you would have to be concerned about that uh, e even more with nuclear weapons involved. Um, and I, I finally add, uh, there has been some other uh, authors who have looked, uh, uh, Ray Take and Jim Lindsay from the Council on Foreign Relations wrote, a, I think two or so years ago, gaming out uh, how we might deter Iran and what a kind of Cold War with Iran might look like, and I actually found it wouldn't be a Cold War at all. You'd end up having a, a hot war that would be conventional on the margins, and you'd have to be ready to engage in all these proxy fights. Uh, again, as we're kind of starting to see that spill out onto the front pages, at least uh, with terrorist attacks and things like that, I think would be more of the same, and uh, I'm not sure that that's the sort of situation we want to endure for several decades. Well, uh, just that um, as you increase the number of states, um, you know, Jamie pointed out, it's, it's unlikely to stop with Iran. It, it's hard to believe that as you increase the number of states that you can cope with all the various interactions. I mean, the world can only cope with you know, one or two crises at a time. And the, and the idea that weapons will never be used with all of the, you know, as they're spreading is, is uh, it's not something you want to rely on. By the way, in this book, uh, there is a professor from your school who makes arguments. My, his name is Mr. Furman. He teaches there. So you might find that of interest. Yes. Hi, uh, Lauren Knowledge. I'm a nonproliferation graduate fellow at NNSA. I was wondering um, do you think that attempting to modify the treaty, like we've been discussing, could potentially prompt the non weapon states to try and negotiate to address some of the inequalities and double standards that we've been talking about, or potentially block that reform at all? Well, before we go any further, uh, if you read the treaty, again, I mean, this is a big if. I'm not sure everyone wants to step up to this 10-minute task. But if you do, you realize that modify is, is a, perhaps a useful term because you can't really amend the treaty. 
the, the amending process requires <coughs> unanimous consent. And if you choose not to adopt the amendment, it doesn't apply to you. But her, but her, I think your point is... No, understood. Understood. That's, just, that's the down payment on the answer, though. Yeah. We're not talking about amending. Reinterpreting, laying down other rules. Right, and then and then that was the debate Henry and I are having because what I was trying to say is is our positions that would be taken by other states whose agreement you would need in this process, and then he was saying why well, those are dumb positions, which is fine except you have to it's it's relatively easy to persuade me buy me a couple of drinks and I'll, you know I'll be, uh, you know but try persuading by the way you you, you heard the solution. <laughs> yeah, well, try that. Try that with the Muslim brothers in Egypt who aren't going to be in the bar with you, uh, and others. Uh, and, and that's my point. Basically, well, you have to persuade people not like me. I, you do, and my rejoinder would be: if you can buy better scotch, as my father would say, buy it if you think that's okay, and you can live with things the way they are. You're in a great position just to do what you're doing, which is not much. And if there's not an emergency or problem, that's a solution. Yep. Uh, uh, Dean Ross retired from the State Department. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, how do you respond to? I mean, how do you respond to the charge that, uh, or to the question that I mean, George talked about the difficulties of trying to come up with uh, progress and cooperation on the, the, the five rules? But what, go, go back to the assumption that. That in fact, the, if there is an expansion of civil energy, this will increase cooperation. Because you can argue that the first ten that we have, ten or so on now, none of it was based on diversion or from civilian nuclear energy. Now the Iranians did it secretly, and now they are claiming that what they were doing secretly was actually part of a peaceful nuclear program, but nobody believes them. I, so think, I, guess I think Victor has a, has yeah, a, that's, that's a ready answer to that. If mine now yeah. is not like the past. Right. Why don't you take it on? Um, well, I think the past is kind of ambiguous, but, but leaving that aside, uh, at the present time, all the non-nuclear weapon countries are members of the NPT in place not to get nuclear weapons. They also, so anyone who is going to, uh, unless you believe that no other country is ever going to get nuclear weapons, if they do decide they want them, they're going to want to get them as fast as possible, particularly in view of our talking about military, possible military responses and so on. So you want to shorten the time uh, as much as possible. And therefore, it seems to me you would go to the place where the weapon materials are most accessible, and that is the civilian program, I mean, the power program. You wouldn't go off and start building new facilities that take a long time, could be discovered, and so on. So we're not saying that countries that get nuclear, nuclear power plants are going to make bombs, but those who want bombs are going to look to their nuclear, weapon, to their nuclear power programs because they have brought them much closer in technological terms towards bombs. By the way, the, the ambiguity of the history points in that direction. There is an excellent book by Larry Scheinman on the Fourth Republic, the French Fourth Republic, and they didn't really make a decision to make the bomb so much as to make plutonium and electricity, and then when they decided to make the bomb, well, they had the plutonium. And I think, uh, in general, there's another point, which I think President Bill Clinton made and John Bolton made, and they both made it, again, something to notice, that when you have the cover of a civil program, it becomes easier to explain away and excuse covert facilities as facilities that, well, we didn't insert any material in them yet, and when they get discovered, well, they're useful programs. So I think, heads up, the future is not going to be as easy to explain away as the past, and boy, have we done a lot of explaining away in the past. I, 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 I fundamentally agree with that, Dean, and I think that's, that, that historically, and I think even looking forward to a number of states that one can 
visit and hear interest in, in nuclear energy. It isn't that they decide or that the leadership decides that they want nuclear weapons. There's a general sense of this is the way the world's going or this is a badge of significant power or my neighbors might be doing it. So, and, and they all have some cadre who's interested in this, who's knocking on the door every day saying, geez, we should have a nuclear probe, peaceful nuclear probe. And at some point the leadership says, yeah, let's go explore that. First you explore it to see whether it makes sense as a power program for electricity. And that takes a long time. Egypt's been going back and forth on this for decades and still haven't decided. But in the way back of recess of the mind is, well, if we did decide it made sense for electricity and go, then if at some other point we decided because we're not getting the respect we deserve or the non-proliferation regime doesn't lead to disarmament or Iran goes crazy, if we decide that at some point we might want a nuclear weapon, it won't just be theoretical, we'll have the basic capability. So in most of these instances, I mean, the U.S. is, I mean, among the first states, they, they clearly wanted nuclear weapons. But since then, it's been much more kind of ambivalent, and you don't make a decision and it's a crash program. You just start saying, well, go out and do some work, and then we can do this, and maybe we'll do that. And, and that's why I think it's still a, a concern. A real-world example, current events, Korea. The head of the Grand National Party retired, just, in Palm, announced, well, the Japanese have said in their basic atomic energy act, just modified, that they're now doing it for national security. My God, we're now sandwiched between two weapons states, North Korea and Japan, because Japan can break out any time to get nuclear weapons, and we can't. We need to recycle. This gets to the gold standard, whether the U.S. will give consent to recycle U.S. origin spent fuel in South Korea, what the Chinese are going to do with recycling. They want to build a big copy of the Japanese plant right next to their military production facilities. It says it would be convenient. <laughs> we have said nothing about this. Our president, who has gotten a great deal of credit for raising the specter of zero nuclear weapons, is silent on this. If anything, he's talked about the value of advanced uh, fuel cycles, and he made a speech in South Korea. Not the signal you want. If you care about this. Now we we touched a nerve. Okay, you're up. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Herod. I'm an independent researcher here in the area. Uh, I was just curious, talking about rules and strengthening of rules. Uh, again, obviously the, the discussion turns to North Korea and, and more prominently today Iran. What increase in rules, what strengthening of rules would prevent such determined proliferators that are Want to well, for what it's worth, my panelists are more optimistic than I. I, I tend to think certain things become facts that are no longer problems. And I think those two things are, become facts. The, the idea that we can somehow use that as the watershed for whether we ever have rules again, I'm a little apprehensive about, but I, I don't want to speak for them. Does, does anyone? Well, I, yeah, I, um, I think Henry's right about North Korea, that, that when we talk about strengthening rules, it's not that then by post hoc applicability it would change the situation in North Korea or Iran. It's not about either. learning from those. <laughs> it's about learning from those going forward. And I think that a number of what these guys have proposed you could interpret as, okay, lessons learned, you know, that ought to be reflected in how we do business in the future so that we don't repeat that experience. Um, and, and and, I, and yeah, with Iran, I think it's it's not over yet, and we may disagree there, but it isn't that new rules would be what you would do. It's how you enforce the existing rules with Iran, and then lots of side security and other uh, issues. But, but the point is the future, I think, is the idea. Jamie? Jamie? I'd agree with that on Iran, that the, the need is to enforce existing rules. With North Korea, I'd just say... My concern there is I think we're not even doing triage appropriately in terms of North Korea and dealing with its proliferation. And uh, again, that's why I'm so obsessed with the Syria case, uh, because I would put that in the category of defensive measures that the United States should be taking with its allies to just ensure that we don't have uh, another case like Syria. 
And uh, again, the, my information is somewhat dated. I've been in government three, for three and a half years. But back then, we were taking a lot of actions, uh, both uh, overt and through intelligence means. But I, I think we didn't even have a handle on the problem. And so I think that would be something. Now, hopefully, the current administration, uh, since uh, initially it, it didn't rush into negotiations, but eventually it was kind of drawn back in. But hopefully, they're uh, tempering that with some other uh, measures to help ensure that, that we have a handle on what the North Koreans are sending all around the globe. Um, but I, I still have a lot of concerns uh, that, again, it's not, it's not even just uh, preventing North Korea's nuclear program or, or rolling it back, but I think we really just need to be taking some defensive measures to ensure that we don't have uh, nuclear technology showing up in another rogue regime or in uh, the anti-terrorists. Uh, let me just add to that. Um, you know, in North Korea, when it turned out that they basically violated the treaty and refused initial inspections. Uh, our response was to shield them from the impact of you know, the requirements of the treaty. Uh, they didn't have bombs yet. Now, who, how they might have reacted had we taken a stronger line is, is, is a speculation. But, but uh, instead of enforcing the treaty, we basically shielded them from, from the treaty and, in fact, rewarded them. You, you need to explain that just a little bit. Because um, it's 20 years ago. <laughs> Seems like yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> People get younger. Uh, well, what happened was that, uh, you know, when you join the treaty, there's an initial inspection. You have to declare all your material and so on. And, and then the IEA goes through and inspects to make sure that that's what you have. And uh, they obviously did not declare some of their plutonium they had, they had reprocessed. Actually, the irony is, had they allowed the inspectors to see the reprocessing, they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have had a problem. But they did it quietly and didn't put it on their material balance. And then when it looked like the IA wanted to check some waste sites, to check on that, they refused. They wouldn't let them. And that is a violation. Now, what happened was, they then said, if you're going to press this, we're going to leave the treaty. And we were worried because the NPT review conference was coming up in 1995, at which point we wanted to extend the treaty and make the treaty permanent, which we did. But we're afraid that it might undermine that. And so instead of enforcing the treaty and, and uh, pointing them as a, as a violator, we worked a deal called the Agreed Framework in which we postponed, more or less indefinitely, the IAEA inspections and, and in return for the Koreans shutting down their existing homemade reactors, we promised to give them, essentially give them, uh, two large U.S. type reactors. So, uh, anyhow, we did not enforce the treaty. And uh, what how it might have worked out had, had we done that and been tougher, and whether the North Koreans would have been concerned about that, well, we just don't know. In the case of Iran, you know, had there been different rules, they would have had to report certain things much earlier. And perhaps we would, you know, our reaction might have made a difference. It's hard to tell. Sir? Yes. Uh, Nick Donahue, I'm a senior analyst with Guardian 6000. And my question was for the panelists as a whole. Um, there's recently been articles about Iran possibly pursuing uh, nuclear-powered submarines. And I was wondering, as that relates to the, the issue of higher levels of enrichment uh, for all non-nuclear weapon states, is this something we want to address as we tighten the NPT? Well, you've just hit upon a topic that my center wants to mine. Uh, you have to be profoundly correct in your question, because we have to answer that. I think the short answer is yes. The somewhat longer answer is there's a problem. First of all, the requirements for naval reactors uh, is an interesting question in and of itself, even for the United States in every instance. Do we absolutely need them for every application? And then there's the question of the level of enrichment for the reactor. Uh, then there is the question of grandfathering that kind of activity in the IA statute, which more or less says that you can do this activity, it's legal, and the material that you produce 
uh, once it goes on to the boat, is more or less left to IA inspections. It's a wonderful cover for a bomb project. And of course, the Iranians have discovered this. And it raises questions with regard to what the Brazilian program is doing. Are there any other comments? You know, I believe, I'm not sure about this, but I think the French use less than 20% material yeah, in their, yeah, they in their uh, naval reactor. So, obviously, uh, they use loom. But of course, this then justifies, in the case of Brazil, they don't really have a, a very solid argument yet for enriching for their civil program, which is still very weak. But they argue, well, they're getting ready for the loom powered French design. So, I mean, it's an, it, it's, it's an emerging question again, in a, in a way that it wasn't before. I think. The one thing I'd briefly add is uh, a friend of mine, Matt Kronig, and I wrote a piece a couple months ago in the Washington Post uh, touching on this issue because, I mean, let, let's be clear, the Iranians, they have no interest in an actual program. They're testing us, and it's part of the gamesmanship uh, that we're going through in the negotiations. And we have set ourselves up for this sort of situation where they can throw out these ridiculous statements about what they want to achieve as cover uh, to enrich further or to make advances with their program. And I strongly believe it all goes back to the fact that we have never laid down clear red lines about what will or will not be unacceptable. Now, I know many people have concerns about even getting into red lines because you tend to then legitimize certain levels of enrichment or certain activities in the nuclear program. But I, I again believe if this, uh, if the United States, if this administration is serious that they think the military option is eventually a possibility, uh, but they're willing to wait, and perhaps more willing to wait than the Israelis, and, and allow Iran, Iran to get much closer to that threshold, I think we need to be clear with the Iranians about how far they, will, uh, they can go before uh, we're going to pursue a, a military strike. And that's the problem right now, because all of our messaging has been such that uh, we tend to actually ignore a lot of these statements. Uh, like they, even when they take action, they reach up to 20 percent, and we express concern and issue tough press releases. But then, you know, life goes on, and we tend to start ignoring the day-to-day -day reality that they have no real need to enrich up to 20 percent, and they're not actually going to be using uh, what, uh, the enriched uranium for the, the Tehran research reactor. So I think we've tended to legitimize already by our inaction these sorts of provocative steps, and uh, I, I'm not quite sure that they're actually going to pursue this one, but I think every time they make statements like this that they should be shot down immediately by the U.S. and, and that we should uh, threaten some sort of action if, if uh, they actually go that far. No, I think you are the last question. Great. Uh, you need uh, to stand up no, and identify no, yourself. Uh, okay, uh, just one point. Uh, someone in Iran threw out 56% the other day. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I was on the yesterday, the day before. Well, um, anyway, my question is for Henry, actually. Uh, and perhaps in one of your future papers, someone uh, will consider on economic grounds whether uh, and keeping in, in sight the problems with the nuclear, with the carbon footprint, whether uh, nuclear power is actually necessary to meet our future energy demands. Energy demand. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, <laughs> if you go on the website, <laughs> Uh, there's an essay uh, called uh, Nuclear Power's Global Expansion, Weighing Its Costs and Risks. And in there, there is a reference uh, both by the um, CEO, former CEO of the largest mar market, uh, or merchant, excuse me, uh, utility, nuclear utility, Exelon, and someone who advises Greenpeace to the same analytical model may be effective, but it's interesting they both like it, and they're using it as a planning. It's, it's by McKenzie, and uh, essentially what this McKenzie analysis suggests is that there's a time value to investments and reductions in carbon, so you're not just interested in spending, let's say, $10 trillion to eliminate carbon emissions 200 years from now. You might be interested in not spending any money and having carbon emissions now. You know, this is a discount rate. And if you look at the problem that way, uh, nuclear power investments get hard to justify for the next 20 years, according to this analysis. So you want to constantly update your analysis. You know, what's the carbon level you need to worry about? What's the rate at which you have to 
reduce it. What's the quickest way to do it? And it isn't obvious right now that investments in new nuclear power are your best bet. So, it's on the web. With that, I guess uh, we have actually come exactly to 1.30, and we're on time. So, I really appreciate you coming. Thank you.